Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, we're going to present Net Positive Education, the Pathway for High Performance Learning Environments. Um, I'm Sean O'Donnell. I'm the K-12 Practice Area Leader for Perkins Eastman. And with me today are my colleagues from CMTA and uh, another colleague from Perkins Eastman. Tony, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, Tony Hands. I'm a vice president with CMTA and uh, I got to help lead the visioning and, and goal setting with Sean and Heather on these projects. And hi, everyone. I am Heather Howrigy. I work as the director of sustainability for Perkins Eastman. As part of this presentation, what we'd like to do is to share two different case studies of schools that are pursuing this idea of net positive education. Both are within the District of Columbia. One is West Elementary School and the other is Banneker High School. Um, and just a little bit of background on both of those schools. West Elementary School is actually transforming from a, a pre-K through eighth grade school into a more conventional elementary school model of pre-K through uh, fifth grade. Um, the Banneker High School is um, a magnet program within the District of Columbia, one of the highest performing public high schools in the city, in fact, um, and serves students uh, in ninth through twelfth grades. Both buildings, as you can see on our sites, are buildings um, that were created back in the 1970s, and they follow the sort of brutalist uh, uh, design ethos. Uh, they were open plan schools, um, and in many instances, they were buildings that had very limited uh, daylight factors. Uh, you know, so the conclusion for both of these buildings on the existing sites that we have was to replace you know, these buildings. That's somewhat unusual for work here in the District of Columbia, where most of the building projects uh, entail modernization and addition projects. But again, because of some of the attributes and the obsolescence of these buildings programmatically and technologically, the decision was made to replace the buildings. Um, we should also note, though, that the building on the right, which is actually Shaw Junior High School, um, is the site of the new Banneker High School. However, Banneker is moving from another site to this location, allowing for the construction of a new building. Just a little bit of background on the DC public schools uh, to provide the context for these two projects that uh, we're sharing with you today. Um, DCPS has, over the past 20 years, been undertaking the comprehensive modernization of its school inventory of about 115 schools. And uh, over 4 billion uh, has been invested to date in these facilities over these past 20 years. And as you can see, they're spending between 300 and 400 million dollars annually on capital construction projects. And ultimately, the goal is uh, to have every school touched by the modernization program by 2025. And as part of the scope and aspirations for creating what we would consider high performance learning environments, sustainable design is part and parcel of the modernization program. The, it's actually a legislative goal of lead gold for each of these modernization programs, but that in many ways is just held as sort of the, the threshold benchmark. And in many ways, the, the aspirations are really to leverage sustainable design, again, to enhance teaching and learning in these environments and truly create a great place to learn, as we'll be talking about for the balance of this presentation. But you'll note that a number of schools are already LEED certified and also that the district uh, currently has the highest scoring LEED for schools project uh, in the world and Dunbar High School in, in the upper right, which was a project done by Perkins Eastman uh, several years ago. And again, has set sort of the precedent for a very you know, aspirational and innovative work, I think, in the pursuit of high performance learning environments and sustainability. The district likewise, um, you know, and following suit on those projects has undertaken several recent projects with the aspiration of pursuing net zero energy, continuing to enhance the performance of the buildings across their inventory um, and, uh, you know, and each individual project, you know, ultimately achieving very high performance uh, you know, with respect to resource conservation. The RFPs for both of these projects 
you know, um, at least mentioned the net zero energy performance. West Elementary, however, had a specific requirement for net zero energy. Um, and the interesting thing to note, though, is that <clears throat> the aspiration for net zero energy, <clears throat> excuse me, was a more recent development, you know, subsequent to the establishment of the project within the, the capital program. So as the project advanced and we were selected as the design team for, for both projects, um, the budget, however, was not adjusted again to accommodate uh, this, this higher level of performance within uh, net zero energy. So uh, interesting to note that again, you know, that the schedule, the budget was held consistent and everything that you'll see about net zero energy and, and the pursuit of health and wellness in the environment uh, was delivered, you know, on the original budget established several years ago for the projects. And following that thread, you know, one of the themes that we'd like you to take away from this process is that you know, the, the goal in many ways for the design team was not only, you know, very, very high performance uh, energy conservation, but also leveraging the net zero energy process to create uh, better places to learn. So thinking very specifically about indoor environmental quality factors I will touch upon in a moment um, to ensure that these places are contributing to the health and wellness, not only of the children and the faculty, but ultimately of the larger community that uh, they're embedded within. And DCPS, again, you know, leading the way in, in many ways, uh, you know, had included within the RFP the desire to pursue the integrated process for health promotion and, uh, you know, within the lead system. And through the conversation about pursuing that innovation credit, um, we likewise came to the table and suggested that there was the opportunity to uh, use the well criteria for both of these projects, you know, and establish benchmarks, you know, again, achieving very high performance levels of indoor environmental quality uh, within these buildings. And then ultimately the decision was made to formally pursue well on West Elementary School. So if everything plays out uh, the way we hope, uh, you know, West will achieve not only net zero energy as a target, but also uh, become the first net zero energy school in the world to be also well certified. With that, um, what we'd like to do is share a bit about you know, how this project is different and how the process uh, you know, was undertaken. Um, but again, what we want to do is reinforce the idea that net zero energy you know, set one benchmark and one goal for the project, but we've also created this uh, similar term and parallel term of net positive education as again, leveraging the net zero energy process and the tools and the resources that it brings to bear to create a, a better high performance place to learn that truly enhances educational outcomes. And as we approached this project, you know, we came at it through a number of different projects that both CMTA and Perkins Eastman have performed and gave us uh, benchmarking data and you know, occupancy information for, uh, that we could leverage to really set the bar for uh, the aspirations for these two projects. One of which is the Martin Luther King School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And you see just some of the pre and post occupancy outcomes uh, you know, through our analyses here, suggesting that the net zero pursuit on that particular building, again, had very significant uh, impacts on teacher satisfaction and student satisfaction within the learning environment. So again, setting the goals for our environment uh, in these two new buildings, but looking again at some of the classroom uh, environmental design factors, again, you can see at Martin Luther King, beautiful daylight, you know, and views, uh, you know, 
the acoustics in the room are wonderful. Uh, it's spacious and uh, pleasant to be within. Uh, the materials are appropriate and healthy. So again, fostering all the aspects of uh, the learning environment that we know enhances educational outcomes. So what we were able to do with CMTA's team is benchmark this building, several other buildings, you know, on performance factors to set the goal of creating the best possible classroom environments in particular for these two new buildings. And with that, you can see, again, some of the IEQ factors that we've been measuring on prior projects and bringing forward into these two projects. So, of course, daylight, you know, both in distribution and glare to, again, uh, enhance the quality of light you know, in the learning environment. And we all know the research associated with uh, um, the impact of daylighting on learning. Thermal comfort, of course, you know, ranging from air temperature, humidity, uh, and leveraging tools to even consider the design of the facade and the thermal imaging associated with thermal comfort, as Heather will illustrate uh, in a few moments. And focusing, of course, on acoustics, which we know is, is the, the baseline for an, uh, a great learning environment that uh, everybody needs to hear and be heard, you know, especially important as learning becomes more experiential and active in these learning environments. So. Uh, attending to not only background noise, but the, the noise generated by the actual use of the facility. And then as the pandemic has underscored an emphasis on you know, great air quality within the learning environment. Tony, why don't you tell us a bit more about the project goals? Yeah, and thanks, Sean. It, it, to second what Sean is saying, we really want to applaud the district as they start to shift from these design-based goals to really performance-based goals and performance-based metrics. We see this across the industry, um, specifically owners are becoming more informed, more educated on the details and are growing their fo focus on uh, the metrics that, that really help us achieve true energy and operational carbon reductions. Um, so that, that becoming zero energy, having a positive impact on the environment um, becomes a, a reachable goal. Um, and so specifically here, We've built on this research that, that Perkins Eastman's done on the metrics of improved learning, um, pulling in the, the metrics of health and wellness that Heather's going to talk more about. And, and the team had um, an intense focus on the why of the building. How can we affect learning outcomes? We really focused our goals in design on those things, those metrics that improve the, the learning outcomes of the project. Um, and so uh, when you look at, you know, how did we achieve this net positive education? Um, we had to do this. We had to meet these things head on if we were going to do that while staying within the existing budget. And so, um, you know, from from dozens and dozens of projects uh, going zero energy, zero operational carbon, um, we have what we feel are are imperatives to achieving these goals, and and those imperatives. Uh, exist around paradigm shifts. Every owner, uh, every district is a part of a complex organization that has years and years of lessons learned. And so you want to work within the experiences of these groups, but create paradigm shifts um, through their unique experiences. And so every project, every path becomes unique, but we think there are fundamental stages. And, and what we did in this process is we challenged um, the thought that this would increase the budget. You know, we started with, with zero energy introductions, zero operational carbon introductions, and, and the typical educational curriculum workshops, building tours, as we went and dove into food service, HVAC, equipment, IT plug loads, daylighting and envelope, and then post-occupancy, we really tried to challenge what in this process adds any additional costs. Um, if we can create a better process, if we can create a more collaborative process, then we can achieve these goals without increasing the budget. So just to dig a little deeper into the process. First, a little bit of background on the actual designs of the new buildings. 
Um, you can see on the left, West Elementary School targeting uh, 550 students, pre-K through fifth grade, uh, just under 90,000 square feet with an EUI of 22. Uh, you know, again, an aggressive target you know, for the building to achieve, but uh, you know, we'll talk about some of the strategies that we've used to get there. And Banneker High School, again, uh, the replacement on the site of uh, the former uh, Shaw Junior High School, uh, targeting uh, and increased enrollment, you know, growing the, the student population from 500 to 800 in the new facility of, you know, just about 175,000 gross square feet and a similar target to, for the EUI of 22. And the whole pursuit of net zero energy and net positive education begins, you know, from day one on the process. Um, both sites are very different, you know, in many ways, but you'll see that the strategies in many ways are similar. Um, and that starts, you know, from the day one when you start, you know, putting pen to paper on, you know, the trace as you start to draw the, the site diagram and understand the site. On West, for example, we had received a feasibility study done by another architect. Um, and, you know, you can see see the orientation of the building here um, that I'll talk about in a moment as well. But you know, the orientation of the building needs to be optimized for the uh, relative to the solar orientation. Um, so that east-west axis that you can see the pink bar uh, drawn on was actually 90 degrees off of what the feasibility study had proposed for the building. So again, Challenging some baseline assumptions and uh, you know, and making sure that you start from day one with an appropriate orientation and configuration and massing you know, becomes critical you know, in the pursuit of these goals. So both buildings, uh, you know, in this case reversed, you know, now Banneker on the left and, and West on the right, um, you know, really strove to optimize the orientation of all of the instructional space possible on these sites so that the, each classroom, each each lab faces north or south, allowing us you know, great control over the heat gain, but also the control of glare in the educational environment for both of these buildings. Of course, you know, what we're trying to do is, is not only optimize on these factors here, we're optimizing the program uh, you know, as well. Um, and the interesting part about these two buildings is while we're replacing two open plan schools, and you know, oftentimes open plan schools are characterized as you know, almost completely unworkable in an educational environment, and one reason why these buildings are being demolished. Um, there was an interesting aspect to the community built with in those uh, buildings and particularly at West about the communication through the open plan environment. So while we were creating something that, you know, had you know individual and distinct classrooms, the goal in many ways to facilitate that community building sense and you know creating the hybrid, you know, where you can open and close the environment uh, became very important at West. Banneker um, being a very high performing you know, environment where many students you know, are the first in their families to uh, aspire to uh, matriculate into college. The idea was somewhat different, but similar in the building community within the building. Um, and what you see in the section here in the diagram is that we took the library learning commons and we literally threaded it through the building of each level to create something that has a distinctly collegiate ambiance. So again, and very aspirational educational goals in the architecture, in addition to the, the, uh, the energy performance goals that we're talking about today, and innovative solutions within the architecture of both appropriate to the developmental stage of each of uh, the schools. So um, as Sean mentioned, from early on in design, uh, some of the initial decisions that we made, even before we were awarded the projects, set ourselves up for success. And one of those reasons is, um, you know, going into the previous facilities that Sean showed images of earlier, we had seen um, the, the, the effects of the design on the quality of the indoor environment um, within those spaces. So. This is West um, Elementary School as it existed before. And what you see here is some daylight and glare studies that we had we were able to do before the building was demolished. And 
the challenges um, that West had in particular are they did have windows, but they had very few windows. And those few windows were actually causing more harm than good because they were creating bright spots and more opportunities for glare within the learning environment. So from early on, we knew that daylighting was gonna be a big deal uh, for the building occupants. It was gonna be one of their top priorities, but also uh, considering the overlap between energy consumption um, <clears throat> regarding electric lighting and the benefits to an improved learning environment through daylighting, we see this as the kind of perfect starting point to, to zoom in on at early design stages. So for West, our uh, initial approach, as Sean was mentioning, has southern facing classrooms and northern facing classrooms. We oriented it uh, in the appropriate direction, um, kind of flipping it from where it was at the feasibility stage. But we also created this central corridor space, which allowed us to um, bring light into the backside of the classroom spaces, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. And that ended up being a very important initial design decision to ultimately help us reach our goals of spatial daylight autonomy. For Banneker, it's a little bit of a different animal. It's four stories instead of two. And, but but the, the integration of that learning commons through this kind of central atrium space that Sean was mentioning actually also played a daylight role, a very important daylight role in getting light deeper into the space um, and again into the backside of instructional spaces uh, using this kind of central atrium approach. So again, early design decisions that were emphasizing not only how we can create a high quality learning environment, but how we can um, kind of improve upon our energy performance um, and indoor environmental quality at the same time. So all of this leads into something that we like to call holistic wellness, where we're looking at kind of all sides of the equation and we're trying to address uh, wellness holistically. Because if we address wellness, then uh, there's, there's more connection and, and likelihood that we can create a positive learning environment that's gonna have more impacts in, ter in terms of student and teacher performance long-term. For West, what our approach to holistic wellness looks like, we actually additionally decide to overlay the well rating system onto our already lead uh, and net zero mandates. And this rating system and kind of going deeply into the well version two rating system allowed us to look um, into wellness and all of these different criteria in much more detail. So. Uh, from an air quality standpoint, we are for West pursuing an increase um, in ventilation within that within that space while meeting our, our energy targets and goals, which is very exciting. Um, there's a lot of focus on nutrition and conversations that we've had with the district around how nutrition is provided um, and how that can be displayed within within the environment and how it can be communicated appropriately. There's a lot of conversations around uh, lighting and and our approach to daylight is already setting us up for success in that area um, and ultimately kind of looking through and going through all of these categories has been very beneficial to kind of add that layer of wellness to the conversation for banneker although we're not pursuing well certification uh, these two projects were under design at the same time by the same teams uh, so it allowed us to kind of overlap strategies between those two and apply some of the strategies that we we're applying to West to Banneker at the same time. I think the additional layer of wellness that we took into consideration from Banneker is really around providing opportunities for stress relief. Um, as Sean mentioned, this is a high school environment and all the students are uh, really working hard to get into uh, into universities from that point and there's a high amount of stress. So. A lot of our approach to wellness was more around the mind category within the well rating system for this project, trying to build in opportunities for activity and for stress relief when possible. So now I'm going to dive a little bit into how our design process kind of changed um, from a traditional design approach and how that allowed us to meet all these big goals and targets that we set up front. So traditionally, design process might look more like this, where everyone's kind of working in their individual streams. Um, and kind of, you know, the design team comes up with the design, they pass it off to the MEP to uh, make sure that we can kind of pull together a mechanical electrical plumbing design. And there might be a, a little less interaction than traditional from there. They pass that off to the contractor, and then the contractor um, has the commissioning agent do the final review. For us, we were much more integrated up front, um, especially with CMTA. Um, and so for each of these kind of different categories for energy targets, you know, the architect was just as involved in the conversation as the MEP was. 
And for you know daylight modeling, the MEP was just in involved as involved in that conversation as we were. So there was a lot of back and forth between the two of us. And I think from that process, we were able to kind of get a better product in the long run. And then as we move into construction, um, the players there become just as important. So making sure that the GC was um, engaged as early as possible in these conversations. It was a slightly different approach for GCs for the between the two different schools, which we can discuss later, but that has allowed us to kind of make sure that we're they understand what the goals are for the project and we're all on the same page. And likewise, the role of the commissioning agent and in particular pursuing enhanced commissioning and uh, building envelope commissioning, which we'll talk about, became really critical to meeting all of our goals. So um, overlapping with this design process, uh, what we needed was to get data at the right time when we were making design decisions to make sure that we were making the smartest design decisions to meet our goals. So we used a variety of tools to be able to do this and to overlap it with the design process in a way that provided us that immediate feedback to be able to make step, steps forward very quickly. I'll show you just a little bit about what we did. Um, at a very high level, we always start with a climate assessment and an identification in particular of what passive design strategies work for this particular location that we might want to integrate up front. That helps us with our building massing and orientation from day one. And speaking to that orientation, uh, there's a lot of design options early on, uh, particularly for Banneker, there was one design option where um, we we're considering a north-south um, elongation of the building, which would have our classrooms facing east and west. That's option two that you see here on the screen. And uh, that goes against all of our kind of understanding of smart passive design strategies, but it was something that we were considering from, from kind of an overall community perspective. What we were able to do is by running some very quick analysis, we saw that that decision of rotating the building to the proper orientation elongated east-west saved us off the bat 10% around energy. It also improved our spatial daylight autonomy and reduced our amount of glare. And all of that is a cost neutral decision, right? So um, this decision actually allowed us to kind of save money long term uh, in terms of kind of being able to meet our net zero energy goals and net positive education targets. We also looked at um, thermal comfort a lot, uh, even for outdoor environments where there were zones where we were kind of planning on having high levels of occupancy. For instance, uh, for West, we were looking at where we should situate a playground for the younger students um, and considering how we could maximize comfort throughout the year by uh, selecting a location that did not have as much heat gains uh, and unwanted sun in the summer and a location that was also protected from the winter winds. So that allowed us to narrow in on a scheme that uh, not only met our net zero energy goals, but also created better quality outdoor environments even for the building occupants. Um, for both schools, before once massing was resolved, but before we started even considering facade design, before a window was drawn on the building, uh, we set window to wall ratio targets that were specific by facade. Um, by looking specifically at the amount of radiation that was received during different seasons onto different parts of the facade, we were able to give the design team um, targets that they could then use as they go move forward with um, their, their um, elevation design. And this allowed us to make sure that when we were placing windows, uh, we were doing so intentionally. So there are areas where we can more easily open up the facade to provide more connection to the outdoors without losing a lot or gaining a lot of um, heat gains or losses, depending upon the season. Um, so this allowed more intentional window placement, which sets us up for success long term. We also had very early on uh, an envelope and daylighting charrette uh, with the um, design team and, and the MEP. And uh, I think this was really important for us. We had already made a lot of smart decisions around the classrooms, which I'll show you some of those in a second, but this allowed us to look at some of the bigger spaces and come up with daylighting approaches as a team that we might not have considered otherwise. Kind of taking that pause up front, coming up with a daylighting strategy really helped us ultimately to meet our daylight autonomy goal. 
So some of the initial studies, we took the best of Perkins Eastman's portfolio and CMTA's portfolio around high performance projects and really did a deep dive assessment of the classrooms within those different schools um, and how they were performing are predicted to perform from a daylight autonomy level and from a glare level. And we took those kind of lessons learned and really zoomed into the highest performance projects to create the base design for the classroom environments for both West and Banneker. And then from there, we were able to kind of iterate on that best approach. So this is a story from West that I love sharing. Um, so we have a limited window to wall ratio on the northern facade for a reason. We don't want to have too much heat loss in the winter. So we set our target for 25% on the northern facade. Now, the, the first four classroom on the northern facing facade is the hardest to get uh, to a daylight autonomy target. So the analysis that you'll see here is based on that classroom. And one of the things that that I hear a lot um, in the profession is that, uh, you know, window to wall ratio targets like 30% or lower um, can't possibly provide the quality daylight environment that you want or need within a classroom. And I just want to show you through a story here how that isn't true and actually how smart design decisions that are informed by data can help uh, actually improve the quality of, of the lighting environment. So this was our, our first stab using all the smart lessons learned that we thought we knew. Uh, we achieved a daylight autonomy of 17% within that classroom, which is very low. So we did a few things. We flipped the Clara story in the corridor to, the, to face south to get more daylight into that corridor. We flipped the light wells to the north to allow that daylight to come further down to the first floor. And then we actually elevated the heights of all the windows without changing the sizes of them and recessed the ceilings. And this allowed us to jump from our original 17% daylight autonomous to a 62% daylight autonomous northern facing classroom, all the while not changing the window to wall ratio. So without just making sure that the glass was better placed, we were able, and not bigger, but better placed, we were able to kind of meet our goals and targets um, and still, uh, you know, maintain our, our goals from an energy perspective as well. Similar anecdote from a community meeting when we were sharing this analysis and information is that the community, at, particularly at West, was very sensitized to the fact that the existing building has very few windows and very limited views and daylight you know, within what's effectively a very dark and dysfunctional learning environment. Um, so when people heard that we were thinking about you know, a 25% window to wall ratio, they became concerned that again, you know, we were recreating something that they had already had. So, I, but I think the rendering that we're showing you here today, you know, in many ways it alleviated that concern that in many ways, our goal was to create the best day lit classrooms that we had done, you know, of any of our portfolio to date. Um, but the daylighting's not the sole um, area of focus here as well. As you can see, the views, you know, out to the neighborhood, across the landscape that we're creating, uh, you know, into the community, you know, also becomes, you know, very fundamental to creating, you know, simply a, a great and pleasant place to learn. So, uh, you know, again, concerns mitigated, uh, you know, and again, reinforcing the fact that, you know, all of these goals can come together to reinforce both the performance of the building, um, but then educationally create the great setting to learn. And then on the larger aspects of the design of the building as well, um, throughout the building, again, this daylighting you know, has really been emphasized to create the, you know, an appropriate learning ambiance throughout, even in the heart of the school here, which happens to be the library both buildings. Um, but you can see, again, you know, through effective use of skylights and then views out to the courtyard, which would be rendered off to the right, uh, you know, again, a great and inviting place, you know, in the very heart of the school, bringing the community together. Banneker, likewise, um, emphasizes the library learning commons here as, again, the heart of the school and this atrium that Heather was describing before. Um, and you can see daylighting coming through the skylights, you know, rendered here up above, and then, you know, uh, bringing daylighting into the adjacent you know, instructional spaces and creating an appropriate and collegiate ambiance within the building. 
This is a photograph from several months ago. Uh, the building's actually approaching completion right now, so it would look much more finished if we were there today. But again, you can see even before the skylights were installed, they were covered up with VizQueen here. Um, you know, the fabulous daylighting and views you know, within the heart of the building. What I love about Heather and Sean's points on the process is that even though we took these deep dives, into each of these components, none of these decisions were siloed. All of when you see a lot of these pictures, you see the same involvement, the same leadership involvement um, across so many of the decisions. As this group came together collaboratively, you know, none of these decisions were siloed apart. And so I'll touch on um, geo and, and system selection and renewables and some of those pieces, but you start to see how all of those pieces had major impacts on the overall goal of the building to improve uh, improve learning. And so, you know, specifically as we dove into HVAC system selection, looking at our goals, looking at where we were, looking at a detailed life uh, cycle cost analysis, um, we, you know, we first went and, and, and listened. We went to the owner, we talked to the maintenance staff, you know, we toured some of their buildings, you know, asked about their preferences, asked about their, their past conditions and, and struggles. And you know, one of the things we heard over and over in terms of operations and maintenance was that the district would prefer the geothermal system over VRF. Um, we did look at water cooled VRF, and uh, the cost estimate um, came back that that those were around the same cost as the geothermal system. Um, we even went and pushed further and said, you know, let's look at the potential for an air cooled VRF, um, and it was estimated to be you know above six hundred thousand dollars less in first cost. Um, so we started the life cycle cost analysis to look at over the life of the building. What does this look like? You know, paying back about ninety thousand dollars a year in annual en energy savings, about a seven year payback, um, and uh, and and really saving the district six million dollars over a twenty five year life cycle. At the end of the day, when the design solution came through, the geothermal bid much less um, that when that was estimated, and so that payback became even. Uh, uh, much quicker and the and the overall savings even larger. And so the the first challenge there to get that drastic energy reduction to really start to um, save on the on the operational carbon was to be able to fit uh, these geothermal systems um, you know onto a very tight site. And uh, never do we have enough land. And so um, as part of the drastic energy reduction goal, how do we uh, start to squeeze that in. How do we, you know, look at the operations of the building, be able to, to locate the field in a way that we can physically build, um, you know, how can you stage these sites? How can you move through them and, and work during construction to build such a facility, um, you know, became an important role. Uh, the closer we can get the, the field itself to the building to be able to help, then the, the more um, heat transfer that we really get. And so, uh, looking through those reductions and, and design decisions and bringing it as part of the team um, became a big goal. The district itself has the BEPS uh, goals in terms of carbon reduction. So we knew if we could um, save on those first costs and, and get these systems into the building that we would really be uh, saving over the life of the system as the, as the district looks forward to um, you know, newer rules and regulations on carbon reduction of comparable uh, facilities across the district. And then the next piece was renewables. You know, what we always say is, is drastic energy reduction first and then renewable energy second, but that's, that has to happen in stages consistently throughout the design of the project. This can't, the renewable solution can't be applied at the end of the day. And so it was a very integrated uh, um, design decision uh, process where at every stage we were doing full layouts of the entire PV system, um, looking at all the renewables, not only from an integrated roof system, but then building applied systems, how they could help out in the daylighting aspects, um, how we could showcase some of the uh, renewable aspects of the building, um, but yet still hide the, the array up top in the most cost effective solution as well. And so as we start to apply the, each of those components in each of those silos, you really see that all of those aspects build on each other. They all have a, a, a total um, effect 
on the health and wellness of the building. They have effect on daylighting. They have effect on operational. They have effect on on maintenance. But each dive into um, you know drastic energy reduction and, and total energy consumption savings. So the high performance envelope when uh, when added to a good passive solar design, um, improved lighting design so that we don't have as much internal uh, heat, improved kitchen operations. Um, then once you've pulled all of these things down, then there's a there's the opportunity to really right size the HVAC system and drastically lower the total tonnage uh, in, in first cost savings. So we saw a 75% reduction compared to some, some similar past projects. We were able to bring all of those components down. And um, what you're seeing there is the West Elementary energy use model in terms of where energy will go on a month by month basis. And the post occupancy will take all of those breakdowns of heating, cooling, lighting, IT, process kitchen loads, and we'll compare them on a month by month basis to our targets uh, as we start to, to get the district towards zero operational carbon in the first year. So now we'll jump briefly into uh, the conversation on the construction. Where are we right now? So uh, we're actually a, a month away from substantial completion on both of the projects. Uh, so we briefly want to touch base on some of the things that happened during the construction process as well. Um, just a kind of quick note here, both schools actually chose to go with uh, different envelope solutions. So for both schools, we knew that we are targeting a uh, high performance building envelope, meeting um, a fairly high uh, thermal insulation threshold, slightly above, above the code minimum requirements, uh, but a heavy emphasis on how we can mitigate thermal transfer through the envelope. Um, was was a big component. The other main component to that, which Tony will talk about in just a second, is making sure that that envelope is airtight all the way around the building. Uh, so two different systems were chosen. For Banneker, it had a more traditional kind of built up wall system. For West, we went with a more integrated uh, system, a, a carrier panel where that thermal and air barrier kind of falls all in one zone and uh, only one trade is kind of involved with that install process. So both both projects pursuing different envelopes. Um, and at the end, we'll kind of see where they both come out and pan out. But, but so far, we've uh, actually been very excited with the success that we've seen on a traditional built-up wall system. And so the wall performance, as Heather mentioned, you know, we really set ourselves um, some lofty goals in terms of what we thought we could achieve as a team. And uh, you know, we always encourage. You know, set that high goal and and uh, and push the construction to to meet that. And so, you, if you look at a at a code minimum of 0.4 um, CFM of air leakage per square foot of building, you know, often high performance building design goals and standards uh, ask for a 0.25. You know, we set a goal of uh, of a 0.15 um, total CFM of air leakage per square foot of building envelope. Um, during construction at Banneker, we were able to go out and test the system. CMTA went on site. Um, it's a very uh, complex construction schedule. And so the opening that we found to be able to get everyone out of the building and to be able to do a, a full building pressurization test was actually at night. So we started the test uh, around uh, 8 p.m. And, uh, and actually went through uh, past midnight on the full building pressurization test. And so just a few weeks ago, we finalized that test. Um, the goal was the 0.15, the building pest tested at a 0 0.0875. So really 30% better than the lofty goal that we set ourselves and 80% better than the code minimum. Um, so I know the, the entire team and contractors to, to the design team and, and owner, everybody was very excited about when the full system tests that way. So here's what that envelope looks like. We're just going to share a quick video with you uh, taken a few uh, months ago during construction to kind of show you how that comes together. Yeah, so here's our air barrier. Yeah. We've got our, our fiberglass brackets that are uh, removing our thermal bridge. And then this is where the insulation goes. 
So this is our, our envelope. Three inches of mineral wool insulation. Three inches of mineral wool. And then eventually we'll get our exterior panels coming down here. Close it all in. You actually behind the weather barrier that Heather is showing down there. of open cells spray from insulation between the studs that are supporting the, the wall. So total is four inches of spray foam, sheathing, fiberglass secrets, and then three inches and a half of For a total R value of? R28. Okay. So where are we now, Sean? So we're almost done is where we're at. Uh, we are under a month you know, from substantial completion on July 15th. So you can see some of the recent photos of West looking awesome. Uh, we're very excited to see you know, that everything's coming into place uh, you know, and the architecture, the educational environments and all the high performance elements, you know, uh, you know, as Tony was illustrating, you know, through some of the testing at Banneker, you know, are, are coming to fruition thanks to the concerted effort of the entire team from the client side to the contractors and, and the design team. Likewise, Banneker is Oh, oh, sorry, more west. Uh, you know, just here. You know, actually, some older photographs just showing some of the uh, elements that we were talking about. Again, you know, with the attempt to dale it, you know, virtually the entirety of the building. The sky lights, you know, over the some of the circulation and the extended learning environments on the left. That part of the school and the library and learning commons. You know, uh, you know here. Then at actually that says Banneker, but uh, this is West. Uh, <laughs> so forgive us on that one. But likewise, Banneker is headed towards uh, July 15th uh, completion as well. So we're very excited again you know, as these buildings approach coming online over the summer and the students will hopefully uh, occupy them in their entirety uh, with the full enrollment uh, you know, in the, the coming academic year starting at the end of August. So just some lessons learned uh, you know, on the process here as well. So as we've been talking throughout, you know, there's a lot of things that are different about the pursuit of a net zero energy, net positive educational environment. Um, and one of the things that we're, we're most excited about is you know, truly living the sort of integrated design process here. And I think Heather had you know, one of the most uh, uh, interesting anecdotes, I think, in the uh, design of the facades, you know, where I think for the first time of my 25-year experience, uh, we actually sat there with the, the mechanical engineering team and we drew the windows, uh, you know, on West Elementary School together, you know, so I think that analysis and that collaboration, um, you know, universally across the design, construction, and client team, you know, has truly been uh, illustrative of the process on both of these projects and the reason why we're starting to see the results and as they approach completion here as well. So again, thinking differently, challenging the conventional wisdom, uh, you know, and you know, design and process, and then ultimately the construction and completion of the projects has been key. Every team, every project team uses the word collaboration. And to have groups that it wasn't, you know, a back and forth, it was a back and forth that happened 17 times, right? So you guys would challenge us on thermal comfort. You know, Heather's gonna call and ask me about CO2 levels and PM 2.5 reduction. And Sean's gonna talk about, you know, how are we really modeling this to, to, to improve the daylighting? And, and Heather and I share the same goal of never having to move a blind in a classroom ever, ever. And so how do we, how do we really go back and forth um, so many times you know, even in a single day about designing a facility that um, that is able to hit all of these goals and, and it takes that open discussion, you know, to be able to do that. Then moving into construction um, and, and the commissioning process, 
I think that they're uh, obviously the earlier the better uh, for both of these projects. We did have early engagement um, on the construction team, which which was very critical. Uh, but making sure that kind of they're involved with upfront decisions and uh, that we can be kind of thinking about and planning for all of these things simultaneously is important. We also brought our commissioning agents on board early on and conducted multiple design reviews throughout uh, the process for both of them. Um, and in particular, I think there was a, a very big focus on the envelope commissioning, which is relatively new, uh, both to the lead rating system and, and to the area in general. So I think there was a lot of lessons learned on that process, but it was really important. And ultimately, I think, you know, going through those design reviews with a careful focus on maintaining the thermal and air tightness uh, throughout both of the both of the buildings is what we're seeing pay off now. So with the 0.0875 CFM per square foot goal, uh, significantly below our 0.15 uh, that we were able to meet on on Banneker for air testing. I think we're we're kind of seeing the benefit of of why it's important to kind of go through that process um, and and do that testing to make sure that we can actually meet the goals and targets that we've set forth to begin with. And of course, once the building's open, that's really just the beginning, uh, and then we get to kind of see how this all plays out. So. We will be um, looking at more ongoing commissioning for both of the projects. Uh, what you see here on the right is actually from a different school, um, but what we'll be doing is uh, looking at the predictions in the energy model that Tony had showed earlier, kind of on, on a monthly basis, what we expect to see um, in each of the different categories and, and making sure that we're either hitting those targets or if we're not, if something's off, let's check in on it that month so that we can make sure that, you know, as we move forward, we're able to kind of meet our, our net zero goals at the end of the 12 months, 15 months um, after occupancy, whatever it may be. So this will be something that we'll be looking at very closely as the school opens to kind of see how we can meet that target moving forward. But additionally, and I just wanna mention that, it's not just the energy targets that we set forth, our, high performance education targets and the quality of the indoor environment, we're also gonna be following up on those. So we have a series of sensors that you see at the bottom of the screen here, which we'll be deploying and testing, making sure that not only are we meeting our energy goals, but we're meeting our goals around air quality, thermal comfort, daylight, et cetera. We're back testing all of the analysis that we did during the design uh, to, to make sure that we're actually meeting what, what, we, what we strove for to begin with. And so I have to remind myself that we started on all these goals. We set all of these um, design decisions in place and we did it all prior to the pandemic. And so, you know, really, you know, the focus on health and wellness, um, the impact of the learning environment, if nothing else, I think the pandemic sort of reinvigorated our approach and it and did nothing more than just confirm the direction of the design, you know, that we we're increasing ventilation 30% above um, you know, what, you know, cold minimum is going to ask us to do or drastically increasing daylighting into the spaces. Um, you know, I, I think those are Im important goals and sets, you know, uh, to put in place. Uh, the district talks about really creating a culture of consumption and, um, having the users realize that, that their buildings, that their actions have an impact on the environment. And that the teachers, the students, the administration um, can really, uh, you know, have a positive impact on the environment. That this building, you know, can be a building um, that is uh, is an improved learning environment, but is also, um, you know, operationally zero carbon and has a has a full uh, positive impact on their environment as well. Um, I think all those things come together because of that. So if we build this building and no one learns from it, then it's a missed opportunity. Uh, so one of the things that we mentioned very early on was we're working hard to also make sure that we're integrating, um, you know, this, the, these projects and this process into the educational curriculum for both schools. This is actually a mock-up of the new sustainability dashboard at West, which we're going to be kind of wrapping up in the next few months as we move towards um, occupancy later this year. And uh, a few of the things that we'll see here is, you know, going to that culture of consumption that Tony was talking about, 
we're going to be able to kind of look at the data live. Students will have the ability to look at the data live, to break it down by wings, to create competitions, to um, you know, sort and look at the data in different ways and, and really engage in it uh, much more deeply. One, so that they can um, hopefully become a future generation of environmental stewards who understand how they impact a building's performance and how the building's performance impacts them. Um, but second of all, there's great opportunities for kind of integrating this information in different ways into different parts of their educational curriculum. So the math teachers are going to engage with this dashboard, the science teachers, the art teachers, there's a component for them. You know, there's there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of things to learn from this building that go uh, that can go very deep. So we're excited to see um, once we kind of complete this dashboard, how that plays into the future culture at West. Which I think touches on exactly why we're doing these kinds of projects. You know, again, over 20 years of modernization initiatives, you know, across the District of Columbia, we're transforming buildings that were old and obsolescent into these great high performance places to learn that truly are creating, you know, active, experiential, exciting, you know, opportunities, you know, through the architecture and, and the curriculum. And, you know that the architecture will support um, so that you know the children the students that you see here you know truly are engaged and excited about learning and you know that their you know, future you know looks bright as a result of uh, you know experiencing this new generation of school architecture here in the district of columbia so we thank you for you know attending uh, the presentation with us today. And we hope that uh, you have the opportunity to ask us questions uh, you know, as, as we go forward. And uh, you know, please feel free to you know, send us emails you know, at s.odonnell at perkinseasman.com or Tony, your email is? Tony at cmta.com. Heather? Ooh, H dot my last name, <laughs> J-A-U-R-E-G-U-I at perkinseasman.com. Great. Thanks all. Thank you.